Welcome to the Technology and Energy Panel Talk as part of ISH Digital 2021. Once again today, we have invited experts from the heating industry and would like to speak about heat distribution and heat emission. The title of today's program is Efficiency with System – The Contribution of Heat Distribution and Heat Emission to Efficiency and Comfort. I would like to introduce today's speakers. First of all, I would like to extend a warm welcome to Dr. Roger Schönborn, Chairman of the Department Heat Emission Systems at BDH. He is also one of the Board of Directors at BDH. Welcome, Dr. Schönborn. Thank you. I would also like to welcome Mr. Ralf Kierig, Head of the Department Heat Emission Systems at BDH. Welcome. Thank you very much. Yes, so we're speaking about heat distribution and heat emission. Dr. Schönborn, I'll put the first question to you. Could you begin by telling us how the BDH department is organized? Which companies are members there and what is the main focus of the department? The department works closely with many well-known companies that produce components for heat distribution and heat emission, whether radiators or embedded surface heating and cooling systems, control components such as room thermostat valves or individual room controllers, or for example, heating pumps and many other accessories. Now let us approach the subject from a technical point of view, Dr. Schönborn. I would like to ask you another question. Heat distribution and heat emission are relatively unwieldy terms. What role do these components play in a central heating system? The best way to explain this is to take the example of a car. When people talk about cars, they all talk about the engine and power. This is somewhat similar to the heating system, because a heating system obviously consists of a heat generator, and there's a lot of talk about that. But there's much more to cars than just that, such as a well-coordinated chassis and a gearbox and, of course, the right tires. This is the heat distribution, that is, the heating connection, up to heating pumps and, of course, radiators or surface heating and cooling systems. Those would be the tires, so to speak. Mr. Kierig, a question for you. The BDH has 12 of its own market statistics. How was the development of heat transfer in the last year? Yes. Last year, both segments, that is, embedded surface heating and cooling, as well as radiators, were very positive. To a certain extent, this was probably also driven by good funding. In the case of surface heating and cooling, we saw an increase of about 14% in tubing meters, and a slight increase of 2% for radiators, probably due to the renovation and modernization of existing buildings where radiators are used predominantly. In new buildings, we are seeing more embedded surface heating and cooling. You have mentioned the distinction between use in old buildings and use in new buildings. As an investor, what do I have to consider if, for example, I am interested in embedded surface heating for a new building? Is it equally suited to all areas of application? What do I have to bear in mind? So, from a technological point of view, both systems can be individually combined with any heat generator and any heating system. In other words, you do not have to pay any special attention to this from the technical point of view. When it comes to the final selection, it's more a question of what features you want as a user. Do you want a system that might give you an additional benefit, for example a radiator that you can use as a towel holder, or do you want more free space in the spatial design? In that case, you would maybe go for an integrated system such as embedded surface heating and cooling. Dr. Schönborn, the BDH, has made the motto Efficiency with System its mission. It also runs a campaign on the subject. What does this mean? What does the slogan Efficiency with System stand for? I think a heating system will work efficiently only if all system components, that is, from the heat generator to the storage, up to the heat distribution and finally to the heat emission, are coordinated with one another. That is efficiency with system. And once this optimum is achieved, you as the end user actually have the guarantee that your consumption is minimized whether it is gas, oil, wood or electricity. Plus, there is also a pleasant side effect. It also gives you maximum comfort and convenience. And don't forget, we know the federal government's goal of reducing CO2 by 55% by 2030. 
An optimized heating system also contributes to this in the truest sense. Zielsetzung der Bundesregierung bis 2030 CO2 um 55 Prozent zu reduzieren und auch darauf zahlt also ein optimiertes Heizungssystem im besten Sinne ein. Let's come back to talking a little about the many possible uses of embedded surface heating. There seems to be a double benefit. The system can be used for both heating and cooling. What can you say about that? That's correct. Even today we don't generally speak about floor heating, but about surface temperature control, because surface temperature control allows not only heating, but also cooling. Certain basic requirements are needed for this. Namely, a system should consist of a reversibly operated heat pump, that is, the heat pump should supply not only warm water in winter, but also cool water in summer. You need the appropriate control technology, and then you actually use it for cooling. We're talking about the possibility of lowering the room temperature by a few degrees. You may already know this from your car. The temperature outside is 28 degrees, and now if you can lower the temperature by 3 to 4 degrees, it is usually sufficient. The surface temperature control makes for silent cooling, meaning there is no draft like the one from an air conditioner. And I think if we look at the warm periods in our summers, then everyone would see that this is actually a smart investment in the future. How important is hydraulic balancing in this context? Very important. You may also have experienced it that your radiators on the upper floor are much cooler than those on the ground floor despite open thermostatic valves. Or when you touch a radiator that is vented and it is warm below but cold above. This is a sure sign that the system lacks hydraulic balancing. You will have to call a heating technician who will then coordinate the individual components with one another in order to achieve the maximum, best possible distribution. And that is also funded by the state. That's a good keyword, state funding. Mr. Kierig, last year the federal government significantly increased funding for modern and efficient heating systems and also made the process slightly more transparent and easy. To what extent does this affect heat transfer? Are there any funding opportunities there? Where can we get information? The federal government has in fact also taken into account our campaign Efficiency with System, which we have already talked about. In the sense that the funding is no longer based solely on heat generation, but ultimately takes the overall system into consideration. As a result, both heat distribution and heat emission are funded here too. This means that, for example, when modernizing the entire system, measures for modernizing heat transfer are also funded to the same extent as heat generation. So you could ultimately say that the efficiency with system principle also applies to funding. This brings us to the end of our program. Thank you for your interest. Thank you, Dr. Schönborn, Mr. Kirik. Thank you for sharing your expert knowledge with us today. You can see some addresses here. They will give you further information on this topic. I would like to thank you and hope you enjoy ISH Digital 2021. Thank you.